Hi Theory students. Today we'll be finishing the chapter on soprano and bass lines in 18th century style. And now, in part two, we'll talk about opening the counterpoint. We'll talk about how to write against a given line. Perhaps you're given a bass line and you're writing a melody. Or you're given a melody and you're writing a bass line. And finally, we'll talk about how to use those embellishments that we used in species counterpoint when we're writing a chorale melody. First, opening the counterpoint. The first downbeat usually implies a tonic chord. And think about the scale degrees in the tonic. One, three, and five. Very often we might hear one and three as a common pairing but also both tonic notes or tonic and scale degree 5. Scale degrees 3 and 5, less so, but those are still possible. Notice that the bass is either scale degree 1 or scale degree 3, and any of the notes of the tonic triad could be in the top voice. An anacrusis or pickup is most often a dominant chord, a five chord, where we have five one in the bass or five one in the soprano being the typical pattern. The anacrusis can also be part of a one chord, so then if you have a bar line here to start the piece, we have a one harmony and across the bar line another one harmony. In order to apply a tonic chord, it is best not to use scale degree 5 in the bass, as that tends to sound like a 5 chord instead of the 1 chord that it should be. Here are some patterns. So for example, if we're in this key, And we have a soprano pattern. Note that scale degree 7 here implies that it's part of the 5 chord, and scale degree 1 that follows part of the 1 chord. So a good pattern to write here might be scale degree 5 to scale degree 1 in the bass. for pickup and downbeat. The next pattern has scale degree 5 to scale degree 1 in the soprano. So a few ways to do this. It might be possible to do that in the bass. So which still strongly implies 5 chord and strong beat, 1 chord. Or in the last example, where we have scale degree 3 and scale degree 1, they're both part of the tonic chord, so we exchange scale degree 1 and scale degree 3 instead. There are many other different possibilities. Look at the example in your book to see the range of things that you can do with a pickup or anacrusis going to the first downbeat. So now let's talk about how to write a counterpoint to a given line. First you want to write the scale degrees above the given line so that you know what's going to fit with it in the key. Then you look at the start and the end of the line to determine where the tonic is implied in the opening, as well as what the cadence is. Fill in the start and end of your new line to match this. Let me show you an example. So here, in this example in D minor, you're given a bass line. If you write in the scale degrees, and 
and do them like this. It should be fairly clear that we're implying 5 and 1 at the very end. So we're going to be using chords that are part of the 5 and the 1 chord. And the very beginning with scale degree 5 going to scale degree 1 also implies dominant going to tonic. So we might do something like this where we have scale degree 5 that forms an octave and then scale degree 3 that forms a third and at the very end if we did something that had a less conclusive cadence instead of scale degree 1 at the end we had scale degree 3 and we followed it by one of our chordal dissonances. If you remember with our chordal dissonances, scale degree 4 to scale degree 3 is a normal kind of resolution. And A up to G forms a 7th, D up to F forms a 3rd. So now we've got the beginning and end of a line. Now look at the middle of the given line. You may want to plan a leap or two where the given line is moving by step or if the given line has some leaps, plan stepwise motion in the second line. You want to consider the contour of your line and where you might want to place a high point. Then go ahead and fill in the middle of the line using consonances and chordal dissonances. We favor the imperfect consonances, thirds and sixths. We like contrary motion, and we like the line to move mostly by step. So now going back here, one possibility may be something like this. I see scale degree 7 over here in the bottom and scale degree 1 following. It may be possible to use another chordal dissonance. There's a diminished fifth. And with scale degree 4 there, it'll be resolving to scale degree 3. Contrary motion. Notice that that octave, the perfect consonance, is on the weak beat, so it doesn't stand out so much in the middle of the line. And scale degree 1 here. At this point, I'd like to get the line going a little bit higher. I've been going almost all by step, so perhaps I have room for a leap. And as we did in our species counterpoint, we had a large leap up. And going down by step is a good way to follow it. So the B-flat forms a high point of the line, and the whole combination sounds like this. That makes for a very nice kind of combination, and there are many other ways you could do this, but you see the logic here. Work out what the beginning and end are going to be. Look to see how things connect. Consider both consonances and these chordal dissonances, such as what we've used here. And then go ahead and try to fill in your line. Finally, when we have a line, we can add embellishments, and we're going to be using the same kinds of embellishments we learned in Species Counterpoint. We'll be learning about passing tones, neighbor tones, suspensions, and although we didn't identify these as embellishments, chordal skips. Think of chordal skips the same way that you did in Second Species, where you move from one consonant to another inside of a measure. And chordal skips work a lot, work a lot like that. Passing tones will fill in the gap of a third. 
So they move by step into and out of the added note. A neighbor note embellishes a repeated note by moving by step either above or below and then back where it started. A suspension delays a line moving down by step by tying a note over and resolving down by step on the upbeat instead of what would normally be on the downbeat unembellished. And finally, a chordal skip moves from one consonant to another within a beat. It's useful to bridge a wider gap or for a line that moves by steps surrounding the arrival with notes above and below. Let's look at some illustrations. In the first example, the bottom line has a gap of a third. So, we can fill that gap in by putting the note in between. You hear the dissonance, but also it makes sense as an embellishment because we enter it and leave it by step, and that's our passing tone. In the next example, the two C's repeat. It may be useful to either go the step above or below to create some more interest or more embellishment. In this case, I think I picked the lower uh, neighbor tone because I knew the bass line was going down and this creates some contrary motion when it resolves. Note here, I could have also, if I wanted to, filled in a passing tone and a neighbor tone together. And finally, in the last example, where the two lines are moving by step, I might want to embellish the bass line by doing a chordal skip, two notes that are both consonant, as a more interesting way to get to the A in the next measure. I could have done the same thing, by the way, by leaving the G in the bass and going down to the B in the soprano line, and that works as well. Look at the example from the book, from a Bach chorale. And imagine we know where we want to be on the beats. leaps here, so we try to make our embellishments things that make the line more conjunct. So in this particular case, I might want to put a passing tone in there, a neighbor tone there, and now I've got a wide gap, so I can fill in part of that gap with a chordal skip. I have that big drop down to the A flat, and let's fill that in. So these embellishments help the line sound a little better, a little more coherent.
We'll be looking at more examples of these in class. That's all for today.